Hi, this is Karen Walby Solomon, and welcome to my podcast, Crushing On. Welcome to episode five. Thank you so much for coming back to listen to my nonsense and rambling and all the other things that happens on this shenanigan place. Today we're going to do things a little bit differently and I'm going to do all the credits and the shout outs and the pleas for listens and recommendations, all that stuff at the end of the episode and we're going to head straight into the interview. So today's guest is Alison Adams, who is a doctor at a government hospital in the Eastern Cape. I chatted to her a bit about the work that she's doing to highlight and show appreciation for the hospital staff during this difficult time. We also spoke about the pandemic and how it's affecting her industry. But, you know, it wasn't only business. We chatted about young adult fiction, what we love, what we're not so keen on. And some of the the classic TV of our teenage years, like Gilmore Girls and Vampire Diaries, and what she's watching now, of course. Yeah, there's no hectic spoilers this week, just maybe for The Handmaid's Tale Season 3. But as always, I'll put everything in the show notes, all the links, everything that you'll need. So yeah, here's my chat with Alison. So what made you decide you want to be a doctor? Wow. Okay, it's actually a really stupid story. And I recently had to tell this to someone else and was like as embarrassed as I am now to tell it to you. (laughs) But in grade nine, we had to do a project. um, And it was EMS, Economic Management Sciences, whatever. And the project was you had to look up like three different careers and you had to look up like what the university requirements were. Mm And what subjects you would have to take in grade 10 to qualify and whatever. It was just basically like them making us do like a little bit of research. And it was a Monday night and the project was due on Tuesday. And what came on on Monday nights on Mnet? Crazy Net. Crazy Net. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I, I was watching and then I was like, cool, let me just put this in. I think, th- I can't even remember what the other two were. So then I I did that one as like the main option and I presented it that the next morning, whatever, in my EMS class because it was an oral presentation. And my EMS teacher was also my homeroom teacher at the time was like, yes, you go girl. And she like latched onto it. And then because she latched onto it, she like told other teachers and then it was like, oh, this is now a like set in stone solid thing she's going to do medicine and then it kind of like got out of control (laughs) where it was like okay I have nothing better to do (laughs) and then I was in grade 11 and I did my job shadowing in journalism because that's actually what I wanted to do (laughs) and um, then my quite senior teacher person said well I'm not going to write you a reference if you want to do journalism because you won't need it to get in, but I'll write you a reference if you want to do medicine because you'll need it to get in. And then I was like, I took that to mean like, I'm not going to write you a reference if you don't do what I want you to do. So I just applied and then I got in and it's really awkward because my first choice was actually social work and I didn't get in for social work at UCT. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, because I didn't have enough volunteer work. So, um, yeah, I could literally be a social worker today. But, um, yeah. That's then I, wild. I got, I'm sorry. You you didn't get in for social work, but you got in for medicine. <laughs> I was just like, okay, you keep your social work degree, whatever. But um, also, I, I think I would have been happy if I had been a journalist. I would have been happy if I was a social worker. I would have been happy if I was a teacher. But actually, do you know, UCT doesn't offer, like, um, undergraduate teaching degrees. They only offer postgraduate mm. teaching degrees frustrating um I think I would have been happy with whatever I just happened to watch Grey's Anatomy that night and then it just changed the course of your life stupid Meredith (laughs) yeah how do you feel about medical shows um I I stopped watching Grey's Anatomy after George died which was like season two and I understand they're now like on season 79 (laughs) but um I I really um enjoy house. Uh-huh. I think it's more like character driven. It's really frustrating the inaccuracies mm. and also like the process where you like 
why don't you just do this test? It would be much simpler or whatever. And you're like shouting at the TV half the time, like, oh my word, I can't believe you did that. Why? Um, but also it's more like about the people and the stories. So I don't really mind, but I have to say, I haven't watched a lot of like, whatever, all the stuff that comes on Mnet, MD, this or whatever. I, mm. I just make you watch a lot of house and you watched heart of dixie didn't you oh, I but that's only because i was obsessed with rachel bolson <laughs> and i literally would watch, even if she was like taking a dump on the toilet i would watch that video like, <laughs> like i would watch anything she makes basically like obviously being topical and stuff how how drastically has things changed for you with regards to covid etc um I, I have to, so like personally and then professionally, I have to say like personally, my life hasn't changed too much because I'm very lucky and I'm very privileged and I have a very easy, um, very like kind of well padded, uh, actually sometimes luxurious life. Like I um, have a secure income and I have a husband who has a secure income and I think that's like a rarity in South Africa. And we both are just not party people anyway. And we both worked a lot before anyway. So that hasn't really changed. I think professionally, um, so obviously it's the whole structure of the hospital and the thinking and everything has changed completely. But for me, it's made me look at a lot of people in the hospital differently. I started doing this like Facebook page called um, Faces of Livingston where um, I go around and I, like, and I like do little interviews with people in the hospital that are non like doctors. So like the man who carries the dead bodies to the mortuary or the guy who collects the laboratory specimens, you know, like people that you, you don't notice, but without them, things don't work, mm. you know? And I think it's like a, a big thing for people to be named and acknowledged because I think then they feel part of the team and they feel like their contribution matters. So COVID for me has really made me like look around at the hospital and be like, you know, this person, I've worked here for three years and I've never known their name. Mm -hmm. And if they weren't here, no one would dish up the food for the patients in the ward, for example. And I've like learned a lot of people's names and jobs and, I went to the switchboard, which is like a tiny room in the hospital and met one of the guys who works in the switchboard has been working at the hospital for 40 years, like four zero. And yeah, it just like has been like quite eye opening. Um, also like quite tense, obviously. <laughs> There's a lot of fear and a lot of misinformation and a lot of misunderstanding. Um, it's also made me really appreciate my career choice because I'm not kind of like exactly in the forefront of it. Yeah. Um, but I don't think there's a lot of places in the world where you can get the kind of training that we get so that even like 10 years into your training, even if you're like a super, super specialist, you can still, a South African doctor can do anything. Like you can put us in the middle of a mass casualty. You can mm. put us in an ICU. You can put us anyway and we will make a plan we'll make it work we will salutate things together we will push patients we will like yeah the it's just that made me appreciate the like training like the excellent training that I've had I'm trying to be more positive and I think um yeah it's working I'm trying to like start every day by thinking about all the good things at the hospital um so what what other pop culture things have you been consuming are you reading <laughs> Uh, okay, reading at the moment. Yeah, that was really hard in lockdown, like not being able to buy books. Because mm. um, I know you're a big you guys, reader. That's why. Um, I know you guys um, spoke a lot about Kindle, but I haven't like made the transition. For you as a person who reads like book books, how has it been moving over? Um, When I started with Kindle, it actually just started as a necessity because there were certain books that I want to read like right now. And there were some books that, weren't available on hard copy or it was too expensive for me. So that's how I started on Kindle. And now it's just normal. So, I mean, it, for me, it, it, I still prefer physical books. 
I don't know. It's just, it's, I like that I can move it wherever and hold it however I want to. But, but yeah, it's, for me, it's just like, it's how I'm getting the content. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't change or whatever. Okay. I would like, yeah, because we were discussing maybe getting a Kindle and I was just like, mm, I don't know. Because for me, reading is, it's ritualistic. Mm. Like I have a chair that I sit in and I have a cup of tea and I put my feet up and it's like, if if I want to relax, that's what I do. I just go into my little corner and read my book. Um, it's like I'm treating myself, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And um, having the book on your lap is like part of that kind of like luxury treating yourself. Um, but I went on like a book buying binge because I actually, you know, where you like buy books and then you put them, you stack them somewhere and you're like, oh, I'll get to mm. it, I'll get to it. To it. I've so, got a whole like bookshelf of that to be honest <laughs> <laughs> so I had like a stack and literally for years like we've moved house three times and I just moved the stack like, to the different houses <laughs> and then I, uh, I was like okay and then in lockdown I actually read that pile of books I like read all sure. of those books like, they were terrible the goldfinch terrible 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 <laughs> and and <laughs> actually awful and some of them are mediocre um but i recently read um eleanor wellivant is completely fine and that was amazing and i'm currently reading i'm reading like a um like a something that which is totally embarrassing and i should be too old to read but just like a paranormal romance kind of novel If I can, if I can get my any any time, I can get my hands on one of those teen high school books. <laughs> no. I, I, I grab it, make cabot. Know, I'm I, a hoe for make cabot. It's, it's like so embarrassing because you go into the bookstore and then they like teen fiction. There's like a huge sign, <laughs> and then you, you you like go and you, and then someone will come up to you and be like, "Can I help you and show you like the Philippa Gregory?" And you're like, "No, I'm, I'm here for the Cassandra Clay. Spot out." <laughs> Like, you know, I used to, um, when I used to work at Reader's Warehouse, so I went back maybe a year or two ago and some people still work there and I was saying hello to the staff and one of them is like, hey Karen, um, your section, the young adult at Move Day, if you want you to know, it's on the other side, but like loud man. So I was like, now all these people see me, this grown ass woman coming into this shop. I was going to go like at least browse the classics, like pretend I'm going to buy a classic book. Okay. I feel like I'm going to be 45 years old and be reading about sexy teenagers who can also fight demons. And people are going to be like, what are you doing? Can you please elevate yourself? But I just feel like I'm still a I'm still a sexy teenager on the inside. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so what is the name of this series that you're reading? Oh wait, it's actually called um The Last Hours. And this first one is called Chain of Gold. It's exactly the kind of thing that I would read. It's embossed cover, a mysterious looking girl with long red hair on the front. And um, it's 100% my vibe. If I had a type, this is this book is my type. And I also found on the shelf something that I really highly, highly, highly would recommend called The Binding by Bridget Collins. This book, I didn't find out until halfway through that it was about like a gay love affair. Mm-hmm. And like, I was like reading and I was like, ooh, so much sexual tension. And that's what happens when you give characters ambiguous names. But Oh, so you thought it was like a like a heterosexual couple the whole time? The whole time. Um so it's really it's excellent. It's really well written. It's very interesting. There's some intrigue, there's some death, there's some like, you know, you, we don't often get to read about non-heterosexual love affairs mm. in written about in the same tone as your, I mean homosexual love affairs in the same tone as heterosexual because it's often like quite um explanatory and a bit apologetic and yeah. I don't know it's just like a different way of writing with this is very much written like a heterosexual love affair and you're like oh it's two people who are into each other and they shouldn't be and etc but yeah oh, okay 
And what have you been watching? Also, lots of shame watching. Um, so I have a separate account and then we have Ian's account where we watch things together. Mm-hmm. So on my personal account, <laughs> what I always watch and um, yeah, like don't tell people about and can't talk to anyone about is Queer Eye. Queer Eye is lovely. It's like a good cry every time. Every time. <laughs> Literally <laughs> chunk every time, every single time. Um, I also recently watched Never Have I Ever. Mm, love that. I... Did you? Yeah. Did you not like it? I was very irritated with the like protagonist. I thought she was like very self-absorbed and she just had a lot going on. She was like a grief-stricken person with psychosomatic disorder, plus like genius, plus fighting her cultural roots. There was a lot of things like happening with her character, which is great. I really liked the two best friends, mm-hmm. Fabiola and Eleanor. Fabiola is a ridiculous name. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I really enjoyed that. And I thought it was cool the like way they were like sort of joking and a bit sarcastic about Indian culture. But also it wasn't presented in a way where it was like, okay, you have to be married to someone that you don't know. She was actually like really attracted to him and he was super Mm -hmm. hot. So it's fine. (laughs) Um, it is cool how they turn that guy because we all we all thought we knew where that was going. That yeah. no, she's gonna end up with the other guy, she doesn't really want to be with this guy, and then this guy is amazing. And so the way that the culture has been doing things, it could actually also work for people. Yeah. Instead of the same yeah, way. Yeah, when she was like talking to that woman at the festival thing and she was mm. like, actually, you should just do what your family said. <laughs> Um, and then on our like joint account, we've been watching a lot of Shit's Creek. Mm. Have you ever watched Shit's Creek? I have not watched Shit's Creek. It seems like yeah. my vibe, but I just don't have time. Like I really do want to watch it, but I'll, I'm going to wait until the hype is down and then I'll watch it. There's six seasons and the episodes are really short. They're like 20 minutes or whatever, and it's easy to consume. It's just, I, I can't stop watching and I don't know why. It's not like Brooklyn Nine-Nine funny, but it's like medium funny, but it's just like I'm so attached to the characters now. Mm. I also found if if there's a gay character in something, I'm like immediately like I want them to succeed in every way possible in life. So there's like the one brother, the brother in the series, David is gay and I just like love him and I love his outfits and like all his catchphrases and stuff. So we've been watching that um, because we are taking a break from watching The Handmaid's Tale because it's a bit heavy. It took me so long to finish the last season. I had to take breaks all the time. So I know, because you thought, like, why is this happening? You literally could have escaped. Like, you <laughs> could have been out of the situation. Like, oh my gosh. Um, yeah, like, some of it, and I don't know, it's just, like, quite um, confusing. And then you're not, like, rooting for her, but you also, like, I don't know, it, it's been mm. really heavy you you know that like the mother or like the matron lady that was in charge of the little place where they trained to do the thing Lydia and Lydia and Lydia yeah there was like a point where I was like okay she's an ally and then she just like tases her and mm-hmm. like chains her up again and then you're like okay she's not an ally <laughs> you, read, you read the hand do you have you read the hand myself I couldn't bring myself to I was talking to someone the other day and she said she was like it's not very similar hmm. it's like much more bland I didn't I enjoy it I actually enjoyed the book and I enjoyed the show too but I'm really like I, I spoke about this with Jamie but I'm really enjoying the sequel okay okay so, like the sequel to the book so it's obviously not 100% following the tv show okay. but it's what I noticed was that the mango, what's her name? Offered June. Offred, yeah. She really annoyed me in the last season. But I wanted to carry on watching because I was interested in the world. I wanted to see like Gilead fail. Like I wanted to see that end. So I was interested in the world. I was interested in the other characters. I want to know how they how they dealt with things, you know, when they went to Canada and that kind of stuff. So that's yeah. what kept me watching. And and what that book does, it doesn't really follow Offred, but it follows other characters. And okay. sort of it's a reveal who those other characters are, so I can't say. But if you're interested in that world, even if you never if you never read the original book, it's so worth it. It's very interesting, it's well written and it just gets you like lost in that world. 
I really like the wife. Um, what Serena. is her name? Uh, Serena. Serena Joy. Yeah, that is her. And um, I, because I like saw her struggle where it was all like her ideas, her words, and and how she was like pushed to the side and marginalized. Mm-hmm. And how she struggled to reconcile that with wanting to be like a good supportive wife. And she was like a really like complex, well thought out character. And you could see that she just was yearning for a child, but also that she saw the flaws in the system, but somehow swallowed that because she thought this is a means for her getting what she wants, which is a child. And like, um, there's so many aspects of Serena Joy that I think are like parallels to the modern woman. Mm. Um, yeah, instead of just being outraged and angry and men can't tell us what to do, I think she was a character who struggled a lot with her identity and her like abilities and having to push that down um, for the greater good. And I think she's more like accurately represents the modern woman's kind of struggle, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, what was the other thing? Oh, and we, we watched all the seasons of Community in like two weeks, which became a bit nauseating, but then we just were like, we have to finish it. We have to like end this now. I, I liked Community though. I was a big um, fan. I also really liked Community, but by the end of it, I like hated Jeff. Mm, oh no, definitely. <laughs> I think I hated him by like season one already. Um, and I love, love, love um, Alison Bree's char- character, Annie. Mm-hmm. And that actually made us go in search of something else that she was in. And then we watched all of Glow. Oh, how did you enjoy Glow? I love it. I, I like, really, really love it. There's like, you're, it's, it's so, um, it's so like, it's like lighthearted and it's funny and it's jokey about women's wrestling and there's a lot of like shiny lycra and whatever. But it's also like they deal with stuff like um, AIDS in the 80s, mm. like homosexuality, eating disorders, people in like positions of power, abusing their power and trying to like manipulate people. Like there was a vibe where Alison Bree's character goes to a hotel and the director tries to like basically say she must have sex with him and I was like yo this is vibes this is Mm. like literally unearthing things and also like the fact that this whole thing starts with her like cheating the husband cheating on her with her best 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 friend and the fact that they it makes them like examine their friendship and realize that they've always like resented each other even when Mm. even like before this happened so I really 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 enjoyed it okay have you seen um, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? I watched, like, I watched three episodes and I really, really wanted to continue watching, but then I completely forgot about it. <laughs> Such a, that kind of show has always reminded me of you. I, just, I don't know if it's because I know you really like Gilmore Girls as well, but any yeah. kind of show where someone is talking fast, I'm like, Alison. <laughs> Um, she, I, I love that show. It, it, it was really good, and I actually need to get back into it. I started like rewatching Gilmore Girls, and it's like a guilty thing that I watch, like mm-hmm. when I can't fall asleep post four. But I find um, now, in re- like retrospect, years later, it's not as charming as you would think. Like, yeah, like a small town where there's mainly white people. <laughs> <laughs> I like some of that stuff is funny and stuff because I do watch just before the, the new episodes came out. And then I got to like the last season and I was like, Kanye, I can't anymore. It was just too much for me. I was like, I know where this ends. I'm not going to. And then I just like watched the final episode before I watched the, the new ones, which was also crap, but still. Um, but I, I can't remember which, which of the guys did you like? I'm trying to remember. I- you mean between like Dean and Logan? Yeah. Did you like Dean? I feel like you liked Dean, didn't you? I know, but the, when re-watching it, I'm just like those baggy leather jackets, I can't make it. And that middle patchy, oh no, I like want. Um, <laughs> but he was like very sweet and endearing and I feel like it, he was treated unfairly. But then he went and married someone and had like 17 babies with that person immediately. Uh, Lindsay. Yeah, so I was like, no. 
yeah, no, you need to learn about contraception. <laughs> um, I, I, oh, what is the other guy's name? Jesse. Jess. Yes, Jess. Um, no, I didn't like him. His haircut was awful. Oh, I love Jess. Jess was like my lambo one. Like, I think I still love him. Even watching back in him, he was so problematic, but I still love him. I hated how he always wore T-shirts with like a long white T-shirt underneath. <laughs> like, that's my main criticism <laughs> of him. It's like, why can't you either just wear a long shirt, a long sleeve shirt, or a short sleeve shirt? Why must you now combine it? Like, why is why is this necessary? What's the purpose of it? Like, are you cold? Are you hot? Like, can you just decide? That was the main thing I didn't like about him. <laughs> Do you remember um, oh. Jan Hendrik in Seven de Lan? Oh, shame. Yeah. He always wore like a t shirt and then like a shirt over it. Yes, yes, yes. That was like um, his look. Don't you find in these like semi soap opera like things that generally the men are like average looking and the women are like extremely attractive and the men are like extremely mediocre? Like that guy definitely had a bald spot there. Eh? Did not. And he still got like Daisy. I will never understand that. Do you remember Daisy? <laughs> I was like, this girl's beautiful. She's like this young, hot, um, waitress at Opi Coffee, whatever. And he got her. <laughs> not even the cute yeah. brother, him. Oh, he's so t- what's his name? Tian. The cute Tian, brother. yeah. Yeah, his shirts were one size too small. But anyway. <laughs> he worked at the, uh, at the exercising yeah. place, whatever. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, what, what are you watching at the moment? Or what's the thing we should all be watching? I don't know. Right now, I just watched Motherland Fort Salem. And oh, I, saw- I yes, really yes. like that. It was so good. If you, I, I suppose if you're into like the, the, the teen supernatural stuff, you, you will enjoy it. Oh, I know you like um, Teen Wolf and stuff. So, oh my God. But this is I way better. Um, what's this thing called? I made, I watched and I made Ian, my 29 year old husband, watch <laughs> Legacies with oh me. Oh gosh, oh no. I was like, no, but the thing is, it's really actually not terrible. I don't like that girl. I can't. The, ca- oh, the oh, hook girl. But she's like a tribrid. And then he was like, are they going to call her a tribrid? <laughs> and then it's like, well, and he's like, this whole show is a joke. Um, but. It really made me feel like I was back in like 2012 and I was listening to like The Fray on the soundtrack of Vampire Diaries. And it, like, it's obviously nothing can compare to Vampire Diaries. Mm. But, but just was, like, I can't go through that emotions again. I can't be like, oh my gosh, I love this. And then they go and kill the character that I like. I can't deal with that again. But then they come back and are reborn <laughs> as their own twin or something, you know? So <laughs> no one ever dies in the Vampire Diaries. Except Vicky Donovan. Whoa, they really like latched on to that day. That was a trauma that never healed for them, shame. I think it was like the first big death, so I suppose. Yeah, shame. It's- you know, all the, like, the cast members still like wish her for a birthday. I'm like, she was there for like two seconds. How do you even remember when her birthday is? Anyway. She was a, a, a bridesmaid at, um, Can- what's her name? Candice? Candice King? Candice King's yes. wedding? So I think yeah. they stay friends. Okay. Must be nice. Um, I really think that's one piece of like pop culture that has influenced my life immeasurably is the Vampire Diaries. I didn't like yeah. watch as much. I didn't finish it, but Vampire Diaries definitely changed the course of my life. Because now it's like everything that I read, things that I watch, I'm like, hmm, I wonder if this person is in any way supernatural. <laughs> <laughs> so then you'll definitely like Motherland for Sam. That's a very wild written show. Do you remember Vampire Diaries season one to three? Yes. I don't think anything will be that good. And I don't know if I'm also just talking to him nostalgia, but it's like that, like you don't expect what's going to happen, but you can see like the seeds being laid down. The characters are interesting. Sometimes I work my nerves, but they're interesting. And like the world is exciting. And yeah, I think you enjoy it. Okay. But, it's on my to watch this, but I'm not going to subject Ian to it. I'm just going to watch it by myself as my guilty pleasure. After I watch Queer Eye and like Chunk, and then I'm going to watch that. So this question that I ask everybody, well, most people, is who was your first celebrity crush? 
Okay, I just want to start this by quoting um, a very age-old adage from Twitter, which is, can we normalize changing our opinion once we receive new information? And I have to say, my first crush was Johnny Depp. Oh, okay, but that makes sense. I know, but I'm embarrassed now. <laughs> because he, like, beat someone. Also, also, Keanu Reeves, and that I'm not embarrassed about because he has aged like fine wine. And, mm. and also, he's flipping cool, and he's, like, he's a white man that I won't mind having around. Other than your husband. Ah, yeah, other than that. I mean, like, he's a white man where I'm not like, oh, we need to cancel but our Keanu- subscription. <laughs> okay, <laughs> who was your first celebrity crash? Uh, mine was, um, also, I think it's... Um, Changing opinion based on what we know now. But mine was um, John Stamos. That's really interesting. <laughs> but, okay. So I always used to watch a lot of Full House when I was small. Okay. And, and he was in there and he was really cute in there. He was Uncle Jesse. But now I think that I read some stuff where, like, where some people are claiming, you know, there's, there's some dodge. There's some, there's some black smoke around him. But anyway, yes, he was my first crash. And I, um, I named my dog after him. So we had this like stray dog that just came to our house and had a order to puppies. And then we kept the stray dog for a bit and then before they took the dog away. But so they're like, what are you going to name the dog? And obviously I was so obsessed with John Stamos. I'm like John Stamos. But you remember this is a female dog because she had puppies. (laughs) So it was so funny for me because, I mean, obviously you know how my mommy is. And hearing her like shout, John Stamos, come here. <laughs> I'm like screaming John Stamos loud because we, we never called the dog like John or anything like that. It was always John Stamos. Oh, <laughs> it's really expiring right now. This is amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> okay. Okay, you, okay. So you <laughs> But I get, I get it. I, I do get it with the floppy hair, like, and he was like a bit like cute and like mm. unalarming. Yeah. Okay. But I think he was sad that, like, because in the show, he was, before he got married, he was the brother in law and he used to wear like leather jackets. This is where I think the Jess and Gilmore girls thing comes in yeah. also. Because he was like, yeah, he used to ride a motorbike and he was like, cool and stuff so I think uh, I think that comes back to why I like Jess and all these ca- Klaus and <laughs> all these oh, characters have you ever seen a man with a better like set of lips on his face oh my word because um, so I remember when they cast him and I was not attracted to him I was like really like Elijah was so cute and then and this guy didn't look so like but then obviously the character was so great that now, yeah. I guess now I'm attracted to him. Yeah, he really did well with what he was given, I must say. But do you remember when you used to go with your mom to the shop on a Saturday and then you used to like make her buy the U magazine for you so that you could tear the poster out of the middle? Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was saying on Twitter today because we were talking about the poster thing and you used to like, pull out by the staples part so carefully that you don't make like a little rip in the middle. Exactly. And, and yeah. the paper in the in the People magazine was always like a little bit dry. So if it yes. tears a little bit, like the whole middle part will come out. At least with the U magazine, it was a bit glossy. It's so like, like you know, it, yeah. the people was yeah, dangerous. I, <laughs> so I have to ask, are you like, a Backstreet Boys kind of girl or you were like an sync kind of girl? I was definitely a Backstreet Boys kind of girl. Really? Definitely. There's some InSync songs that I like, but I didn't have that. I think InSync came a little bit later and I was really into my Backstreet Boys zone. Yeah. Like Kevin Tom Backstreet Boys was my guy. And and I still think, like I know this is like a, one of the later songs, but the call is still one of my favorite songs. <laughs> and like it tells a story. I love a song. It tells a good story. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it tells a story. It's got like these different moods you go through. Like singing it's so nice. The, the beat is liquor. It's just such a great song. Yeah. And the thing about the Backstreet Boys, I think that was more successful than InSync was that there was an emphasis on their individual personalities, mm. like the best boys, 
with like in, in sync, there was JC Chazé or whatever, and there's JT and they were like individual personalities. And it seemed like they were like trying to outcompete each other. Yeah. Joey for Toad. But I had you. <laughs> Remember Boyzone? Yo, um, was that with Ronan Keating? Yes. Okay, shame. Yo. I quite actually don't know any other member of that band other than Ronan Keating. You, do you remember what is the first like CD, as in like actual CD that you ever got? Yeah, it was um, Britney Spears, The Baby One More Time. Where she's wearing like the school uniform and a yeah. two pony. Do you know okay. how cool that CD was? Because we could put it in the computer and then they showed you like, it was like a diary. And there was like music videos. So I was like obsessed. I was like, yo, <laughs> it can be a CD and a computer thingy. Like... <laughs> <laughs> no, like so advanced and most advanced technology ever. Um, yeah, my very first ever CD that was given to me was Atomic Kitten, mm. the album, which was completely white. So they were obviously all white, but also they wore white and the background was white. And so it was just like, I don't know, like. Is that the one with like, like Hole Again and, like, and, uh, and Eternal Flame? Eternal Flame, yeah. Wait, did, um, was it the original three? It was the original three, yeah. Because mm. they also like change a lot, like the sugar babes. Oh, yeah, sugar babes. You know, I some of people love them. don't remember them until like someone mentions them. You're like, oh, yes, I definitely watched that music video at the end of KTV when it was like five to five before <laughs> open time. <laughs> that was the best time. I used to try and phone in to send a dedication on that part of ktv all the time with the music what is it called like sound i don't know oh did you also like phone the radio station to like be like no hi nigel (laughs) i never i never called the radio station but like ktv was cool because you know it's other children phoning as well i also um i don't know like there's lots of things that you don't realize but you know all those people like on ktv and like yo tv and stuff like we literally grew up with those people Mm. and like they are the same age as us now like that's so weird like Pabi Malloy whatever her name is she's like the same age as us and it's like weird did you see when the YoTV presenters went to watch the Spice Girls in London yes Sade or whatever yeah yeah. and I was like yo they're still friends and it's probably that's like their school like that's their high school friends yeah Except that they got paid to do it and we didn't. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. Once again, all the info about recommendations will be in the show notes. That was Alison Adams. You can find her at at Ali the Ironic on Twitter. And we will link to the Faces of Livingston Facebook page in the show notes as well. Me, you can find at Karen Welby on Instagram and Karen Welby's with an S on Twitter. If you enjoyed the show, please tell everyone you know about it. From your grandmother to your best friend to your neighbor, anybody. But also, you can rate and review on Apple Podcasts. And we just want to say a special thank you to Mariah Fan SA and 2103 who reviewed this week we really really appreciate it you can find the podcast at crushing on pod on twitter and we're now on instagram at crushing on pod we do fun little polls we post fun pictures and all that kind of stuff we ask questions we do all little treats on fridays we have movie quizzes on instagram so there's a lot going on there's a lot to enjoy you can also send any feedback to crushingonpod at gmail.com and you can find more info about the podcast at crushingonpodcast.com. All episodes are edited and produced by Rebecca Barches. And don't forget to subscribe on any network. We are on everywhere. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, any place you can get a podcast. So join us here again next week. Bye.